But this book is genuinely a, you know, a set of think pieces about the aspects of the American dream. Can you tell a little bit about your own personal background and how that shaped your thought patterns into this book? Sure. I am not a baby boomer. I'm actually older. I'm an old guy. I was born in 1940. So my very first memories of life are about World War II, which seems like ancient history to all of you. But it was the greatest single event in the history of mankind. I mean, the whole globe was involved, and, uh, and freedom as we know it, and, and democracies were in peril. I mean, the Germans actually had a plan for what they were going to do when they got here. They knew about our munitions factories in New England, and they had plans for agriculture. Um, it was fought on six of the seven continents and all the seas at the same time. Fifty million people perished before that war was over. And it, in a way, it made America. We were um, in a deep depression before the war began. Everything stopped and was then directed toward the war effort. And when the war ended, America became a colossus on the world stage in terms of its economy. We were the great manufacturing center in the world. Russia had gone hard into communism. China was one of those places where on the map it might as well have said, beyond here are serpents lie. We just didn't know what was going on there. And uh, so these veterans came home who had not known any prosperity. And they went to college in record numbers and got married in record numbers. And they built the America that you all have today. I was a part of that wave as a young man. My father had dropped out of school at the age of 10. My mother couldn't afford to go to college because it cost sixteen. It cost hundred dollars a year. She was sixteen at the time. Very bright woman. They had these real working class values, and that's how they raised me. We moved around a lot from job to job, and I had from an early age a real curiosity about how the world works and and how there was social interaction in the community. And I was always fascinated by politics, and got to uh, a small city by South Dakota standards, which helped change my life. I met. The woman to whom I am still married there, a lot brighter than I am, and we've been, we had a wonderful adventure. And we set off not quite knowing what to expect, but we were pure products of the 1950s when everything seemed possible for our generation. And America was changing. The civil rights movement was underway. Even though we were engaged in a Cold War with the Russians, the uh, field was wide open for people who had some ambition and, and some ability. And in those days, if you came out of college and went to work for IBM, Steve did at one point, probably became a lifer. The, the job was going to be there and you could count on it. And things had proportion. Uh, the first home that my wife and I bought in California was $42,500 in Los Angeles. Up in the hills, beautiful home, uh, and it was in a prosperous little cul-de-sac. I was making, because I was in television news and doing pretty well at the time, I was making $40,000 at the time. I was buying a home that matched my salary. So that, and gas cost 30 cents a gallon. And California had 20 million people, not 35 million people. So life was kind of good for us. And then the 60s hit. And the boomers, the people who came after the war, began to push back against what their parents represented. because. Even though I did call it the greatest generation, I often say it wasn't the perfect generation. They came out of the war with a kind of regimented idea of how things should work. And the counterculture grew out of the baby boomers who had more freedom, they were more highly educated. And they also had economic freedom because there was real prosperity in the land and they could drop out of school and still get a check from home and do what they did. So that's the kind of short arc of my life. And then I rose to certain heights in journalism, began to write as well as to broadcast, and uh, began to raise a family. Daughter at Stanford, daughter at Berkeley, daughter at Duke. Uh, Stanford daughter is now a physician in San Francisco. The Berkeley daughter is a senior executive at Warner Music, and the Duke daughter is a um, psychotherapist who has a new book out called Fortitude about women in their 40s. So we led this kind of quintessential American life. But in our family, and certainly in my profession, I never stopped taking the temperature of our society and where we fit in and what, what was changing. And I was, always had this great curiosity. And the business that you're now in, I was aware of very early and made a point of getting to know some of the pioneers, Bill Gates particularly, when Microsoft came online and helped bring him 
to NBC because I knew it would be transformative, um, not just in the software, but in the content of it and how we shared it, that information. And I wrote a book called The Greatest Generation about World War II, and, and that was in 1998, and it was kind of a, a wake-up call to the baby boomers. They didn't realize what their parents had gone through for the Depression and during the war, and then how they'd sacrificed to make life possible for their children. That started a national dialogue uh, across the country about values and, and, and how we invest as citizens. And then we kind of lost our way at the end of the 20th century, it seems to me. And when 9-11 happened, uh, some of you were very young at that time, or I guess all of you were alive, but you were very young, but it had an electrifying effect on the country. <laughs> it, it, it just united the country briefly, in which we began to pay attention to where we stood in the world and the fact that we had enemies came as a surprise to us, even though we'd been attacked in embassies and, and on our warships and the, um, and the Persian Gulf. And we let that slide away. And so for the last four or five years especially, it seems to me that we've kind of lost our way in terms of where we want to get to and how we get there as a society as a political culture, as an economy, and how we fit into the world. In 1980, when Ronald Reagan took the country through a deliberate recession to try to correct for inflation, when we emerged from that, it was still a pretty much a clear playing field for America. We didn't have China and India, Brazil, and Russia as economic competitors. Oil was around $15 a barrel. And as you well know, the cost of energy falls through everything. In the last four or five years, uh, it seems to me that we've been knocked off our bearings. So I'll wrap up this little narrative with a question that I hear as I go across the country, more than any other one, from parents my age and younger. Will our children have better lives than us? Because that's always been the essence of the American dream. My children will have a better life than I do. I've been trying to recalibrate that question. It's met mostly in the past, will they make more money? Will they have a larger house? Will they have more cars, more freedom to travel because of their financial security? And I said, we ought to change that equation from quantitative to qualitative. Will the next generation give us a more just society, more economic opportunity? Will we begin to educate all parts of America so that they can have their place in the American dream. That led to this book. And so in the course of the book, I talk about proportion when it comes to housing, about the importance of all of us getting involved in education, about the place of journalism. I'm a grandparent now, so I have a sense of urgency about what I'm leaving my grandchildren, the life that they'll have. And the question that I keep coming back to and then providing an answer for is the role of all of us. A hundred years from now, uh, historians will look back on this time and they won't make a judgment just about Herman Cain and his current problems or President Obama or uh, Bill O'Reilly on Fox News or Rachel Maddow or what the latest Google app is or the latest dispute over the Android. They're going to make a judgment about all of us. What did we leave behind? How did we respond to this challenge in our nation? The 20th century was called the American century. And I think it led us to a certain amount of hubris. We thought it would always be that way. Conditions have changed. So what I'm trying to do here is to just start a dialogue, kickstart a conversation, if you will. And all of you uh, should be front and center on that because you're inventing the new world. Um. Both in The Greatest Generation and in this book, uh, you have as one of the themes that the early experience of the Depression and then the wartime uh, uh, were. uh, pain and uh, heroism, it was sort of what led in a very real way to the positive aspects of the 50s and 60s. Yeah, I, I just will tell you one thing that some of you probably will appreciate. When I told my daughter I was writing a book, in effect, that what I, I hope would be kind, broadly speaking, metaphorically, 
letter to my grandchildren. She said, I don't want some sappy letter about your <laughs> school days when you had to wade through snow to get to school, you know, and you didn't have as much as we do. I don't want that. And I said, well, that's not what it's going to be about, Ashley. Mm -hmm. And the greatest generation, which I wrote about, which I often say, these are your, in some cases, probably your great grandparents. I do think that they were formed first by the Great Depression. They, you know, when they were your age, there were no opportunities remotely like what you have. It was about shared sacrifice and shared jobs and shared housing and shared f food because it's hard to imagine how desperate times were. There's just a little passage in this book that, um, about a man who kept a very careful di diary in Youngstown, Ohio, which was the great steel mill center at the time. By Christmas of 1934, the steel mills were operating at 12% capacity. And that was the heart of the American industrial empire. People were trying to sell their passports from banks for 70 cents on the dollar. Hunger marchers were walking down through the streets, not like Occupy Wall Street. They were on their way to Washington singing the battle hymn of the Republic because they were in danger of starving to death. So they came out of all that and then they were thrown into the war. And when they got thrown into a mili military regimentation in uniform and then at home, it accelerated their maturity because they learned to work together, they developed discipline, they knew about risk management at the time. Back here, they were inventing everything on the fly. I talked to a machinist uh, at uh, Boeing who worked, he was a farm boy, but he was really handy with his hands. They were building the B-29, which was gonna deliver the long range atomic weapons to Japan to help end the war. They were building it 24 seven and he said the engineers would leave us drawings on yellow legal pads the night before, and we would lay the parts overnight by kind of eyeballing. Think about the invention of that. And so that, I think, helped form who they were. And it, and it created the foundation that we're all the beneficiaries of. You, in your own way, are creating this whole new technology, and you're finding new ways to advance its use every day, so you're a part of that. But what I would hope that your generation would do would be to look beyond that technology. The line that I use is, and I'm fascinated by it, by the way, I'm not particularly skilled at it, but I'm on it constantly. The line that I use is that you're not gonna get rid of global poverty by hitting delete or change global warming by hitting backspace. And no text message will ever replace a whispered I love you or holding hands on a first date because essentially we advance in humankind by putting our boots on the ground and getting our hands dirty and spending nights in scary places and making a commitment that advances our own passions and our own sense of justice and we have to do that as individuals and then find like-minded individuals to form coalitions to advance that. Fascinating. Uh, if I can change topics a little bit. Uh, you were the f only anchor in Berlin, I believe, uh, of the, the night, night the uh, yeah. wall fell at one of those defining moments. Uh, curious your thoughts about multiple outbreaks of freedom that we've seen, that of course the opening of the shackles on a number of the other eastern countries. And then in the past year, the quite surprising uh, Middle Eastern popular, genuine popular revolutions. Your thoughts on these outbreaks? Yeah, you are living in the age of freedom. I mean, there has never been as much on planet Earth as there is now in terms of free choice, not just in the individual lives that you have and the technology that enables you to, uh, to practice that but the Arab Spring was a very dramatic development in your lifetime. That part of the world will never be the same again. It was preceded by, obviously, the, both the fall of the Soviet Empire and the redefinition of communism in China. People often ask me about the big stories that I've covered, and I said that 9-11 was the single hardest day I ever had. We didn't know what was coming next and what the consequences would be, and it played out for some time. But I believe that in my professional career, the more consequential story in the long reach of history was the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of communism in that part of the world and the liberation of people in the Balkans and, uh, and around the southern rim of Russia. And it's still playing out at this point. We're still trying to find our way. When I first went to China, it was essentially 
a 19th or 18th century country in the heart of Beijing. I'd go for a run in the morning down to the Hutongs, which were the communal areas of Beijing. And people would be cooking and doing their morning toilet outside with a sandpipe. And they would be cooking on charcoal stoves. So I would come back, soot coming out of my ears because the air was so dense. I stayed in the Peace Hotel in Shanghai in 1975. The rats were as big as cocker spaniels running through the hallways. Uh, and think of the transformation of that place since then. So it was very dramatic. And you know, it's been exhilarating for someone of my age to be witness to that. Now, at least some of the more recent stories have had very strong you know, Twitter, uh, et, et cetera, aspects. Of course, the fall of the Berlin Wall was heavily televised, and you know, media, the media really had an impact. What are your thoughts on the role of, the, of both the communication media and the human media? in these activities? Well, I get asked that a lot. And I have a surprising answer for older audiences. I say there's never been a uh, richer uh, journalistic uh, environment than the one we live in now. Because on your Mac Pros or on your PCs, for those of you who still have one, uh, <laughs> or for anything that you have that gives you access to the internet, you can, with a keystroke, you know, dial up the Financial Times from London if you want. You can get the latest release from the Saudi Foreign Ministry. You can get the offerings of the think tanks uh, in Washington. I'm on the board of the Council of Foreign Relations. We've got a first-rate website that every day that you can dial into it, in effect, and get a quick brief on what's going on that, that's very important internationally. But you can no longer be a couch potato. You know, my generation grew up with the idea you go to the front porch, get the paper, read it in the morning, see a little bit of the Today Show, come home at night, watch the evening news, that's it. Those were your choices. That's no longer the case, as you well know. But you have to be proactive in where you get that information and develop your own test for whether it's reliable and credible and useful to you. I have a friend in Montana who's a very apolitical woman, and um, she goes on the internet a lot, and she'll come to me wide-eyed and say, you're not going to believe what I read on the internet this morning. And my answer always is, you're right, I'm not going to believe it. Uh, <laughs> so I, I do think that, uh, that we have to develop a new kind of vigilance, if you will. Uh, Bill Clinton says that uh, we've got an atomized society. That's a pretty appropriate way of putting it, and that we probably ought to have some sites in which there are kind of fact-checking sites and places that you can go to to make sure that that's true or not true. Have you any thoughts of following up on that, if I may, on this, you know, th this tension between integration and disintegration of groups? You know, not everybody got to watch you every night uh, with a reasonably authoritative news story, but as you said, uh, you won't believe this one. Yeah, uh, or more to the point, you will believe it, but, it's a uh, fractured, but, but you're not talking to anybody it's a, else. Yeah, it's a fractured landscape. I, I give you the short, short history of, of especially television news uh, at the network level. That was, in some ways, domestically as transformative of what you're doing. When Huntley Brinkley and, and Walter Cronkite began their broadcast across the country, for the first time, if you lived in the remote reaches of the Cascade Mountains in Washington or in the Piney Woods of Georgia, you were seeing the same thing at the same time, and you can make decisions about the direction of your country or what was going on in Washington or, and be aware of the culture that was growing up in different parts of America. Um, now, of course, that screen is much wider. It's got many more, many, many more parts to it. And there should always be a role for what we do on the evening news, Brian Williams and, and Diane Sawyer and now Scott Pelley. They still deliver a lot of viewers every night, still a lot of eyeballs there. Here's a question that some of you probably don't think about a lot because you, you're drawn to other media, but I, I do this with older audiences. Bill O'Reilly is a hugely popular figure in the cable universe, and he never tires of telling you how popular he is, by the way. <laughs> uh, and he often says, you know, I've got the number one show. And people think he's got this enormous audience. He has half the audience of the last rated show on the evening news, Scott Pelley. And when Katie was there, the audience had really gone down. She still had twice the audience that Bill O'Reilly does. 
every night those three broadcasts deliver 20 million viewers. Um, you know, divided by three, Brian gratefully is in the lead. That's still a lot of people looking mm -hmm. for reliable sources of information. The culture of journalism should always be important in our lives. It'll come to us in different ways now, but we must remember that, a f that the press is the oxygen for a free society. People need access to information that is fairly gathered and tells them about what's going on in their name around them so they can make decisions about their own life. Now, I'm going to just let you in on one other small conversation I had over the weekend with um, my friend Walter Isaacson. I worry that this book would become roadkill on the Steve Jobs Expressway, by the way, because of the <laughs> enormous and, a, and appropriate and understandable popularity of that book. And Walter and I were talking, we were both on Meet the Press on Sunday, and he, he said something that I hadn't thought enough about. We're both old traditional book people. We like printed pages and we like covers that are first editions. And he said, I'm making a real point of buying as many first editions as I can because 20 years from now, I don't think it's going to be as easy for me to call up again the electronic books and to know where they are and to keep that library in the same way. And he said, there's still a magic about the printed page. I guess I feel that way as well. Well, I'll, I'll ask one or two more questions, if I may. Uh, people should uh, be thinking about questions they would like to ask. Uh, and uh, we have two mics set up. Um, in both the Greatest Generation uh, books and this one, there's a very interesting emphasis, partly uh, reflective of your background of growing up in you know, middle of the country, small uh, America, and then the ex various explosions. There's fascinating comments about your own now extended family, which has people from everything from you know, East Co uh, Coast Russian Jewish family to Cherokee background and so forth. So it's a fascinating counterpoint. To what extent do you think that the shaping of America is being affected by the shifts of the center of gravity of people and of backgrounds like that? Well, you know, America is always a petri dish. There's always something going on within it. And that's what makes it such a fascinating place. We have always been and we always will be an immigrant nation. Outside of our Native American population, the rest of us all came from somewhere else. And most of the, and there's a kind of social Darwinism about that. They came here because they had ambition and they wanted opportunity and they wanted to you know, advance their, not just their families, but their dreams and their ambitions as well. Um, and, you know, we are seeing a different mix now in our population. There's a lot of paranoia uh, in the Southwest about illegal immigration coming across the border. Some of it is justified because of the violence that has been visited in pot on those parts of the world and the influence of the drug cartels. I often say, however, that there is less concern, for example, about uh, Asian Americans moving into the neighborhood, uh, and, and in part because they come here with a well-defined idea of what they want to do, for the most part. I can't make absolute generalizations, but that's, that's mostly the case. When I was a young reporter at Berkeley in the 1960s in the free speech movement, Mario Savio, and the place was filled all day, every day with protest against the war of protest for free speech. I go to Berkeley now, and most of the faces are Asian Americans, and they're engineering students, and they're, you know, they have a whole different kind of mm -hmm. destination in mind for them. And that's how this country works. We're constantly evolving and changing, and I hope always trying to become more than the sum of our parts. That's, I think, a, a simple formula, but I think it's an important one. And we, you know, with my grandchildren, I went out, my eldest granddaughter is now a freshman in high school, but when she was in the seventh grade, I went to her school with other people about my age, and the teacher did a smart thing. She said, write down the grandparents and the seventh graders, what were the best memories that you have, the most, I suppose, striking memories you have of your seventh grade experience, and we'll ask the seventh graders here to do that. We all talked about the fact that we were segregated racially that almost, there was only one who grew up in the Bronx who went to a school where they had people of color. The rest of us all went to all white schools. Um, 
And of course, they began, the seventh graders, with computers and the place that they play in their lives and the fact that they have access to them. Mm -hmm. We were the radio generation. <laughs> you know, that's how antiquated we were. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, it was, I thought it was a very useful exercise to see how the country wow. has changed. Uh, one uh, final question, if I may, before uh, asking other people to start lining up, uh, if you would. Uh, the basic structure of this book is a series of chapters on various topics. Each chapter basically uh, begins with a quote or vignette, then a section about, quote, the past. Okay, so this, you, they're neatly labeled. Then the present, and then the promise. I'm very curious what you think is the real promise, what you think we should be doing to get there. Well, the, the promise of this country and uh, our, our rule of law and the foundation in, in law and in opportunity and the migrant experience that we have and the pluralism of America, to say nothing of the extraordinary resources that we have, both natural and man-made. Uh, I live all across America, I, you know, from the west to the east and back and forth, and it still takes my breath away when I fly over this country. And then we've got the 100 best high institutions of higher learning in the world here. People come here because they can be educated here. We have, uh, companies like Google, I mean, which didn't exist that long ago, and it's now defining this new world. So that's the promise. The promise then requires the rest of us to work even harder at fulfilling that promise and keeping it alive and keeping it elevated. Yeah, some of it is hard. There's no question about that. But when the historians look back on, their, on our time, I'll, I would like to think that they would say America lived up to its promise. And it's not just a matter of trying to be, we're number one, we're number one. It's how you, prov how you provide a quality of life for your citizens. That's what the ultimate promise is. There are great challenges out there, but it seems to me that we're up to it. Um, I'll just tell you one other thing about Bush when he talked about the past, present, and the promise. When I began to write this book, uh, there were two things that prompted it. One was that I interviewed President Obama in Dresden in the spring of 2009, the 65th anniversary of Normandy, the greatest military invasion of World War II. And Dresden had been firebombed to rubble during World War II, and then it spent the next 40 years behind communist lines. But here was a city and a country that was reinventing itself after its shameful past of the 30s and really doing a pretty amazing job. So when I was interviewing President Obama, our first African-American president, an extraordinary transition in my lifetime, I said casually to him, I've just come from Berlin. I was there the night the wall came down. And he said to me, yeah, I know, Tom. I watched. I was in law school at the time. I thought, oh, my God, he was in law school at the time. So that was kind of the opening that I had in mind for the book. Mm -hmm. My editors came back to me and said, you know, people buy books based now on the really first two pages of it. And that's a wonderful opening, but we need to come out a little faster and a little harder. In journalism, it's called uh, tightening up the lead. And I got it. I was a journalist. So I went back and rewrote the opening to try to engage people. And the line that I came up with to open the book, which is, I think, central to the book, is what happened to the America I thought I knew. And it's been uh, pretty interesting to me. That's the one I get repeated back to me by a lot of people because they read that. Well, well thank you very much. Uh, let me just start uh, going to the, well, we appear to have at least four people on each side. If you so, speak right up, one of, the, um, one of the conditions of people my age in broadcasting is that we all had severe hearing loss. We had those things in our ear all those years, you know, and ouch. Walter Cronkite in a setting like this, uh, was a wonderful man, uh, he was asked a couple of questions. He was having a hard time with him, and he said, "You know, the acoustics." And uh, he said, "It has nothing to do with acoustics. I'm I'm deaf as a damn post." So, <laughs> uh, well, so speak right up. And let me ask uh, our colleagues back there to uh, <laughs> adjust accordingly, please. Tom, um, first of all, as what Stu was saying, it's a great honor that you're here to us today. But even a greater honor is for me to ask you a question. Um, can you give us the commentary of the Republican? nomination process, who do you think is going to be winning? 
this, but also what's the general election, the presidential election going to be like? I'm going to give you, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to hand this out free of charge. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to give you the best line to keep in mind of, uh, for the next nine months, maybe even longer. Uh, it's been my lodestar. And I've been covering American presidential politics for almost 50 years. I believe in the UFO theory. The unforeseen will occur. We don't know yet what conditions will exist when we go into the booth in November of next year. We don't know who the candidates are going to be at this point, what the tickets are going to be. A perfect demonstration of how quickly things can change is this past week with Herman Cain and these charges of sexual harassment. Uh, the hardest thing in the world to do, I honestly believe, in terms of having personal courage that doesn't require you to face enemy combatants, is to run for president of the United States. A friend of mine who was a senior political advisor to Jack Kennedy said, if you want to run for president of the United States, you have to be prepared to strip naked every day at high noon and take a bath in the most popular public square in town <laughs> every day during the campaign, because that's how you're examined. I would hope that we would break out in terms of the dialogue and conversation that we're, we've been having. Most of these uh, Republican debates thus far have been either kind of persnickety attacks on one another or only about job creation. And that's the central question. But they, they have made what effectively are kind of grandiose promises without any backing them up. You know, there hasn't been enough examination of that so far. I was struck a week ago by the fact that Rick Perry was going hard after Mitt Romney because he may have hired, unwittingly or otherwise, an illegal gardener. And the next day, Muammar Gaddafi was shot uh, as we changed the future of Libya. So the contrast between arguing about illegal gardeners or getting rid of Gaddafi was fairly striking to me. And I think we need to worry a little more about that the, the Qaddafi experience on illegal gardeners, quite honestly. Thank you so much for coming. I was wondering who your most challenging interview was. Pardon me? Who your most challenging interview oh, was. Um, I get asked that a lot. Um, I was the first journalist to ever interview a general secretary of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, and it was Mikhail Gorbachev. It was a signal about how they were changing. That was tough because we knew that he wanted to send a message to the West, but at the same time he had to play to the hardliners back in Moscow. And it was going to be one hour simultaneously translated. Um, it was quite successful. It got a lot of good reviews, and it was the beginning of a long friendship that I have with him to this day. But it was very tough because he had no experience with a reporter before, certainly with an American reporter. When I went in to do the interview, and the arrangements had taken nine months, um, Typically, the Russians in those days were still doing things in a kind of Stone Age way. And I looked up, and they had put their own microphone on him. And it looked like kind of a, uh, a bad sculptor's idea of a, of a clenched fist. I mean, it was this piece of iron hanging off his jacket. So um, I just signaled to our audio technician, we've got to change that. And I reached over, and I took his microphone off. And as I was taking it off, my God, I'm just reaching up without telling him. I'm taking the general secretary of the Communist Party who has an entire nuclear arsenal at his disposal <laughs> without saying it. He's staring at me. And um, I said, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Secretary, but this is what I have to do in my job every day through the translator. And it came back through the translation. He said, you would not believe what I have to do in my job every day. <laughs> um, and that was a challenging interview. But I will say this, that you know, most, when, you, when you interview heads of state, they're pretty practiced. And it's tough to get them to get really spontaneous with you. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was always an enormous challenge. She would just eat us for breakfast. You know, the reporters would sit there, and she'd just swat us aside. Uh, she was very self-confident about what she was doing. Bill Clinton could talk about anything. You know, you just light him up and he'd take off in about nine different directions. Uh, uh, so that was always fun, but it was also challenging. Um, but the fact is, in the long, many years that I've been doing this, most impressive people that I have interviewed are many of whom, whose names I don't know because they were people who were doing courageous things, not expecting any attention or credit for it. It really began in the civil rights movement in the South. 
I'll never forget a night in America's Georgia. The town was at a tinderbox. It was ready to go up. And the uh, African-American community had gathered in their end of town to decide whether to march. And uh, the white redneck population, including the Klansmen, had said, anybody who marches tonight will be dead by morning. That was just advertised up and down Main Street. Streets were lined with pickup trucks with uh, broad axes and with shotguns and pistols. And when the small Baptist church where the African-American leadership had gathered, uh, broke up the meeting at about midnight, this beautiful young woman, maybe 19, came out, kind of wide-eyed, and I said, what have you decided? And she said, well, we're gonna march. And I said, my God, aren't you terrified? I was scared. And she said, of course I am. I said, why are you gonna march? She said, we have no other choice, and marched. And that has lingered with me forever because it showed the strength of her conviction. And the civil rights movement changed our country so much for the better that it's almost hard for me to tell a young audience of what it was like then and how much better off we are now. Uh, Dr. King liberated not just black America, he liberated all of us. Even the most tolerant of us, he liberated it through law and nonviolence. And he did it without a cell phone. <laughs> he, he didn't have tweet. He didn't have texting. He didn't have email. He was able to do it through the power of his conscience, the strength of his voice, and his trust in the rule of law in this country. It was pretty amazing. Thank you. Matt? Um, that anecdote actually feeds nicely to my question. You've seen social and political movements rise and be successful, and I'm sure you've seen some wither away and, and just kind of die. What are your hopes and predictions for the Occupy Wall Street movement? I'm sorry, what was the last uh, part? What are your hopes and predictions for Occupy Wall Street? Oh. Um, um, in this context. Well, I've watched a lot of social protests from the ground up over the years, and this one um, has uh, as little definition as anyone I've ever seen. I understand the rage. <laughs> I, I understand the rage. I don't know what the goals are at this point. And it's, because it's kind of amorphous, and it has gotten the country's attention. What I have said to, I have a number of friends on Wall Street, and um, some of them are even responsible. Um, and I've said to them, if you don't begin to change from within, there are gonna be more restrictions placed on you, and people will have less to do with you. It's gonna always be an important part of our economy. That's how we finance things. Google couldn't exist without people providing money for Google to get started. Now Google can buy the world, of course, but in those <laughs> days, it was different. And there are people doing good work every day on Wall Street. They need to get together and send a message. You can't have the government bailing out Wall Street to the tune that it did, and then having everyone at the end of the first quarter paying themselves these enormous bonuses and not expecting some kind of a pushback. But I think that Occupy Wall Street has to look within itself and say, what is it that we're trying to achieve here? There are a wide range of opinions, kind of everything from nihilism all the way across to labor practices. And, um, and as a result, I don't think that they're having the impact that they might otherwise. That's what I think. Please. Um, <clears throat> do you see a relationship between the uh, growing uh, inequality and in distribution of wealth, the concentration of wealth, in the hands of the few and the decline of the communism uh, and the decline of the labor, the power of labor? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, the 99 plus, the 99 versus 1%, I think is a, a very smart way of, of positing that. I happen to be in the 1% and I'm grateful for that. I won the lottery in my business in a way. But it doesn't mean that I am unmindful of what's going on in the other 99% because I have members of my family who are in that. And, uh, where I grew up, that's where a lot of people are. Uh, again, the whole CEO compensation disparity between those at the top and the, those on the factory floor needs to be addressed, I think. Uh, I believe very, very much in a meritocracy and an incentive and, uh, and providing that incentive for people to do well. I know that there are um, business leaders that um, have a very marketable skill and they can go to the marketplace and get rewarded for that. But we've kind of just lost control. The middle class is losing ground. It's not, it's not even stalled, it's losing ground. 
And as you go across the country, you find so many two-parent families where both parents are working just to keep up. And then when the housing bubble bursts, uh, they may have lost their home or it certainly declined in value for them. Uh, that, those are the seeds of what I call um, domestic insecurity. Uh, the strong economy provides domestic security in this country, a well-being, a sense that anything is possible. It's very hard to get people to think about doing other big jobs like reforming education or uh, changing anything, including politics if you don't provide them with an opportunity for economic security. Now, I just don't think it's been addressed very much. A, a perfect example, almost none of the political dialogue that we have going on at the moment uh, really specifically offers any kind of solution to the uh, mortgage meltdown in America. We've got 20 million homes in America that are either in foreclosure or are in a stress state or in peril of going into a stress state. And I have yet to see an imaginative idea for relieving that sum. A lot of those people who are in those homes want to pay something. You know, they're determined to hang on to their home. It's their entire net worth in many instances. And they're not getting very much help on that. And uh, it's that kind of boldness that we need to hear more of and less about illegal gardeners, in my judgment. Uh, Matt? Please. Hi. Uh, well, the first thing you said was. Louder. Pardon me. The first thing you said was how World War II was a tremendously important event, and you yourself were, to a certain degree, at the forefront of a lot of lionizing that went on um, about 10 years ago, uh, cultural touchstones like Saving Private Ryan, that sort of thing. Do you feel there's some danger to that in that we see, even now in the era of fourth generation warfare, where no war going on really properly resembles World War II, that we have a tendency to paint things as being World War II, that there's, at least in our political discourse, there's this idea that if there's ever a question about going to war, people who say no are Neville Chamberlain. There's a Hitler, a final boss of this country, that if he's killed, then freedom will prevail. And it's, World War II looms so large in our imagination that it colors how we react now, even in ways that places where it doesn't fit. Yeah, that's, a, that's a very important question. Uh, when when uh, political leaders decide to go to war, as they did in Iraq, it, it kind of triggers uh, a form of nationalism, which everyone wants to be um, in the parade to see the boys and girls go off to war, except people who have gone to war. They all have different feelings about it, those who have seen combat firsthand, and especially the military leaders. Uh, but the military leaders are there to carry out orders and to offer their best advice. When we went to war in Iraq, I had some real doubts about the long-term possibilities for it. I'd been over there a lot. You know, I was inclined to believe he had weapons of mass destruction. I didn't know for sure. But I'd been with the UN inspectors and they were, they were led around in merry chases. He was a bad guy. I could see that in, around every corner when you were in Baghdad or in the outlying areas about how people lived in utter fear. But my long-term concern was that it was going to be harder than anybody in the administration was saying that it would be, that it would be more expensive in terms of blood and treasure, and that at the end, Iraq would revert to kind of tribal governance, that it would be the Shiite versus the Sunnis and the North versus the South. And I knew the country was so broken that despite these promises of the administration that they could finance a lot of the war by getting oil revenue $70 billion out of it. I thought, you know, they haven't been there. They, the intel on the ground was terrible. So you're quite right. We don't learn the lessons from war to war. Vietnam, you know, you would have thought, would have said to us, you can't have a war and have guns and butter at the same time, just as one piece of it. Um, I write in here about Robert McNamara at the end of his life, how he went around and, and had a kind of national confessional about how we went to war on the wrong terms. But the emotion of war often takes over. It's, honestly, it's harder, to, it's harder to stop a war than it is to start one. And that's a terrible commentary on where we are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming. It's, it's nice to have someone speak who's nearer to my age than the average age here. I was, <laughs> I confess I'm a pioneer boomer. I was born in 1948. And I further confess from my personal history that I was a pioneer nerd as well. 
Sir, there's a great deal in your description that I don't recognize, particularly about the 1950s upbringing. In our household, World War II and the Depression, particularly the threat of persecution, hung over us like a pall. I also don't recognize a lot about, you've said about opportunities to be educated. I'm fortunate, my greatest achievement in life is that I raised a son who is now gainfully employed in a full-time job with benefits. The reason is we taught him to write and we taught him to negotiate. We live in a suburban district, wealthy school district, high achievement scores that gives a totally inadequate education and threw me off the school board because I wanted to change that. Where in your description do I hear about this? I think this is the biggest threat to our country, the lack of skills in the general population. What can we do? We are unwilling as a people to do it. How can we change it? Well, I actually talk about that a lot in this book. Uh, and the, the one encouraging part about public education that I have seen recently is that people are beginning to talk about it. If, you, if I were to give you a quick synopsis, it would be very much in what I presume is your thinking, that w uh, those of us who could move to the suburbs or send our children to private schools, and we left the inner city to its own devices. And it was kind of one size fits all, and we walked away from our moral obligations to these schools in the inner city and in the great urban areas of America. That is beginning to change. People are now beginning to pay attention to it. You know, New York is certainly an imperfect process at the moment. But Joel Klein and Mike Bloomberg said, we're not going to allow this to go on the way that it has. Uh, there are lots of private enterprises that are trying to help out. I'll, I'll just tell you about two in the book that will be of interest to you. There's a very successful and, uh, commercial real estate developer in Atlanta by the name of Tom Cousins. I really didn't know him for a long time, but I'd always hear the same thing. He's a great man, people would say to me, and I'd be a little skeptical about that. So I went, set out to find out about him. He's a third or fourth generation Georgian. Uh, he developed a new form for commercial real estate development, made a lot of money. But he was always troubled by what was going on in the inner city and in the African-American neighborhoods. So he read about a place called Eastlake in Georgia, uh, right outside of Atlanta, the southern uh, perimeter of Atlanta. And it was called Little Vietnam because it was a war zone because of drugs and school dropouts. 5% of the kids graduated from high school in that area. It had, in the middle of it, a historic golf course called Eastlake. It's where Bobby Jones, a legendary golfer, played his first round and last round of golf. Tom is a golf aficionado. He went down and he had a hard time selling to this community. He said, I want to start by restoring that golf course and I can sell big memberships and we'll take the money and we'll begin to change the area. To cut to the chase, he did restore the golf course. He took all the money and a lot of his own. He built mixed income housing. He brought in black middle class families and, and working class families, put them there. He created a, char a charter school named after a prominent uh, African-American physician by the name of Charles Drew, who did a lot of work in the blood area, named the school after him and made him the hero of the school. It is now the number one school in the state of Georgia. They're called Purpose Built Communities. Warren Buffett saw a documentary about him and said, sign me up. They've done it in Indiana. They're doing it in Charlotte. They're going to do it in Omaha. They did a big project in New Orleans. There's another school in uh, uh, Cincinnati called Taft, worst school in the Cincinnati system, one of the worst in Ohio. The Cincinnati school district did a very bold thing. They said, we're going to take down the old school in effect. We're going to leave the physical building. We'll make it a magnet school for technology. They sent out a very aggressive principal. He said to the teachers at lunch, if you don't want to work harder than you have been and be part of the most successful school, I don't want to see you after lunch. Most of them came back. He went into the city of Atlanta and talked to a service club, and the man who runs Cincinnati Bell, Jack Cassidy, went to him and said, I'm your partner. And he went out there, put computers in every classroom, he wired the neighborhood for wireless, gave the kids a cell phone number, and it's now the number one school in the state of Ohio. A lot of that is going on. We just need to connect the dots to all of the yes, pieces. Yes, there's You're quite one right. There's, I did a documentary one year in Milwaukee because um, Springdale is the name of the suburb, I think. They got a great school system. One block away, 
you have a, a bombed out Milwaukee school system. And the good folks in the wealthy suburb are providing some scholarships, but never enough. We need to break down those barriers and make it available to everyone. I think there's going to be a lot more choice. I think they're going to get more people in the teaching profession. And the business that you're in is going to make it easier for people to have access on a daily basis if they want to homeschool or go home and, and work on things. Yeah, there's one in uh, Middlesex County, too, which my son went to, and it's brilliant. We just have to do more of it. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah, well, one of the things I say in the book is that my generation, if we want to leave any kind of a legacy, that was a place to begin. We're all the beneficiaries of good education for the most part. My wife uh, is, uh, has a book club at a school in Harlem. I've been helping a school in the South Bronx, an elementary school with a wonderfully innovative public school administrator. Um, so we've been involved in these kinds of things, and we all need to find a way to do it in some fashion. Thanks very much. Thanks. Um, we'll try to squeeze in a couple more people, but let's see. Please. Hi. You mentioned that the fall of communism in the Soviet Union is one of the greatest moments that you've lived through, and that happened in no small part due to America's involvement. You also touched briefly on the Arab Spring. What do you see as we go forward and we try to find our way as a country? What is our role in the larger global humanity? And what role should we be playing as other countries are struggling to find their identity as well? Well, I, I, I do think that a challenge for your generation, and you are emblematic of what's possible, is to uh, repair and restore the American education system. Uh, because that's going to be the great level uh, leveler in the future of the global economy is how well educated we are. You know, uh, my guess is that most of you have already traveled physically to different places and so on. I've got grandchildren who have, uh, who are ages 14, 12, 5, and 3. All four of them have been to Europe already. I didn't get there until I was 28. Um, I was just telling you one story that comes out of the book. This is an adaptation of my generation to that generation. When my San Francisco granddaughters and I were in Hawaii, at one point we all went down, I took them down to the beach, the girls, and they were 11 and 9 at the time. And we were on the beach and we'd been out kind of body surfing and we came back in and I could see the waitress coming down to the beach at the resort hotel where we were and I'm, and my mind is racing. How am I going to order for the girls? What do I order for them? And before I could say anything, the 11-year-old said to the waitress, Ma'am, we'd like two virgin pina coladas. Will you join us, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, but I do think education is the place to begin and to understand the acknowledgment that we're not Colossus America without challenges. We're still an enormously powerful country with uh, the greatest cyber technology in the world that was invented here and the greatest possibilities. But um, it, we can't take it for granted. We have to work at it every day. So that's why I've used the phrase re-enlisted citizens. Find something that you care about personally, but that also will be to the great advantage, greater advantage of this country. Hi, thank you Hi. so much for coming. Um, I watched my grandfather, who was a World War II vet, and my dad connect to Walter Cronkite. I'm thankful for your time with us because I started watching you when you were on the Today Show. <laughs> <laughs> so you are my Walter Cronkite, and we look to journalism through folks like you and Mr. Cronkite as really, yes, being the oxygen for us. I feel like there's so much pollution now in journalism there's not as much oxygen to breathe. I feel like a lot of it is editorialized so that middle America just gets the opinion before they actually hear the news and then go and discuss it at the dinner table or at McDonald's or via a blog or whatever you do now. Mm -hmm. Is there a recalibration that needs to happen with journalism so we keep our government leaders to yeah. task and everything else? I think you have to work harder at finding straight reportage because opinion is the flavor of the moment. I mean, even the New York Times and their We Can Review now has shifted so that it's a lot of opinion, but they make it clear. I don't have trouble with opinion as long as it's labeled opinion so that you kind of know, well, this is somebody who is going to tell me what he or she thinks. And then there are other places where you can get the information. 
But again, it goes back to what I said originally. You just have to work harder at it. You have to be more proactive as a news consumer. Um, and, you know, on these small screens, there's a world of possibilities in terms of what you can get. And, um, and it's, that's pretty exciting. I also think, by the way, we were talking about education, the whole business of online education and what's available out there, what you can access, is just phenomenal. I mean, you can stay at home and homeschool yourself at my age, um, as it were, about what's going on, any interest that you have. Our family's been going to Turkey for the last couple of years because it's a, you know, it's the intersection between the East and the West, and it's a beautiful country, and, and it's got great, not just Byzantine sites, but ancient Roman sites. I go online and uh, I get this virtual tour and read the best archeologist and find out where to go. That wasn't available not so long ago. Let me take one last one. If you don't last one, okay. Last one in the audience. Thank you. Uh, as a gentleman mentioned, there's a lot of people in this company in their 20s, a uh, very young company, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what your conversations have been like with people of that age right now, specifically, um, what your views on the character of, of our generation in, yeah. in the 20s right now and how they compare to other, other generations at our age. Um, well, and, I'm, yeah. frankly, I'm in awe of your generation. I mean, you're so smart and you, uh, you're, you know, the cliche about you're teaching your parents how to drive this new technology. Uh, but that does not mean that I don't think that there are some things that I can kind of uh, alert you to. I was at uh, Stanford giving the commencement address a couple of years ago and my daughter, the Stanford graduate, I was, saw her in San Francisco and she said, you better read the Stanford Daily, Dad, or the Cardinal, I guess it's called. So I read it and they had, they had surveyed the graduating seniors about what they thought about having me as a commencement speaker. <laughs> and one of the young women said, Brokaw, that's like listening to adult radio. Uh, so she gave her name, unfortunately, and I gave her a shout out when I got to the podium. <laughs> I, I, I'm not gonna tell you who it was now, but I said, bop, 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 turn your iPad, turn your iPod to adult radio and listen to whatever pleases you. I've got something to say to these students. And what I said to him is what I said earlier about, you know, it's not all the answers are in those laptops or in your PDAs, you know, that you have to figure out how these are really just tools. It's your heart and your mind that will use them most effectively. And that's what you have to decide for yourself. I was at Stanford recently doing something else about H-1B visas, about how we can keep the best and brightest who come here from around the world. Um, and a law student, a senior, I was working in the, in the law school courtyard uh, before I went on to my next appointment and this young man came up to me, had I thought a really appropriate question, um, it's one I'll leave in the room for the final question, and that is he said, Mr. Brokaw, is my generation going to lose the true meaning of friend? What does friend mean? Is it a verb? Do we have lots of friends just because they show up on our Facebook? Do we use it too casually, or should we be thinking more about the definition of friend? I think it's a really good question. Who's a friend, and why are they a friend, and how do you measure a friend beyond friending someone on Facebook? Well, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, let me just end with one uh, Google story because I've been. Oh, good. Uh, I've, I've actually been, like everyone else, I've been fascinated by, um, by your business and your company since the beginning of it, and I've gotten to know it pretty well. I've been on the campus in California a couple of times, and then I went to the Google Zeitgeist Conference um, in, um, when they had the first one, I think, in Palo Alto, as mm -hmm. I remember. And they asked me, I guess I can say this, this is going to get streamed at some point, right? I've, I've got to tell you the story. It's already been out there. They asked me, uh, Eric Schmidt asked me to do something. He asked me to come and speak, and he said, I'm going to have your friend Yvonne Chouinard come and talk as well. Yvonne Chouinard is the man who founded Patagonia, that company, and he is one of the great, great environmentalists of our time and one of the most inventive people that anybody will ever know. He reinvented all the climbing equipment. But he's a Luddite when it comes to technology. He just doesn't, he thinks that man was given hands as tools and we ought not to lose the opportunity to use those tools. And I said, well, you don't want Yvonne to talk because he's not very good at, at speaking. Why don't I interview him? And I said, well, that's a great idea. So we waited until the morning was over and they'd had a lot of highbrow stuff about the philosophy of the internet and uh, 
John Chambers from Cisco was there talking about the global routing uh, questions that are going to be involved. And so I went out with Yvonne at the end of this. He's about five foot two or three. He's one of my very closest friends. And he's just phenomenal life. You know, more first routes in Yosemite and everywhere in North America than anybody else. Climbed all over the world. Built this company from nothing. And uh, we sat down. And I said, I think most of you know who Yvonne Chouinard is. And they, there was a lot of nodding. And I said, so we're going to begin with some basic questions. Yvonne, do you have a cell phone? He said, no. And I said, do you have a BlackBerry or a smartphone? What's a BlackBerry? And I said, oh, I held one up. And he said, why would I have one of those? And I said, well, you have a company that has a lot of online business. You've got a lot of stores. And he said, yeah, but when I want to talk to my manager, I go in and see him. Or I call him on a, on a, on a regular phone. But he said, they don't need me pestering him. So I don't need one of those things. I don't need for people to know where I am all the time. I don't want to be a part of that. Then he went in, to, he, he said to the audience, that, you know, we were given these hands as tools. He said, I started my business, in effect, as a teenager fixing old cars, 1938 cars, taking them apart, building them back up again, rappelling off cliffs to do falconry. And he said, it was my hands that allowed me to do that. And I strengthened my legs and I learned how to climb vertically. And he said, I was in an ice cave for 10 days on, um, in Mount Fitzroy in, in Chile, and he said, I had a lot of time to think because I had no other devices to distract me. That's when I got the idea for the company that I now run. I needed to make better clothing that would last. And then I said to him, but Yvonne, you know, um, in your passion, climbing, cyber technology has now moved in. People are taking their laptops with them when they go to the Himalayas or when they go to climb somewhere, and he just, you could just see the energy drain out of him. And he said, yeah, there are probably some of you in this room who've done this. He said, you've hired an outfitter for $50,000 in the Himalayas, and you've picked out a peak that you're going to go climb. And you've got your little espresso machine, and you've got your laptop, and you've gotten yourself, bought a lot of Patagonia gear. We're grateful for that. You got yourself all dressed up. And then you fly to the Himalayas, and your guide and outfitter meet you. And the Sherpas carry all your stuff up to base camp, so you don't have to carry anything. And you get there, and you've got a little satellite dish, and you go online, and you say to your wife and family, I'm here. It's going to be the greatest adventure of my life. And the morning that you're supposed to summit, he said, the guide wakes you up, fix your breakfast, and then one ropes up in front of you, and one is behind you to get you up to the summit and get you back. And then you come back to base camp and you write to your friends and family, I summited today. I have one of the great achievements of my lifetime. He looked out at the audience. He said, I don't know how else to tell you this except you're an asshole when you left and an asshole when you got back. <laughs> it went totally viral on the internet. And he got a standing ovation from the room. So I always thought, you know, we've got to keep that perspective in there as well. Thank you all very much.